Please open your Bibles to the Old Testament, book of Jeremiah in chapter 18, Isaiah, or rather Jeremiah 18. I want us to read verses 1 through 9, a little bit lengthy reading, but read it with me please. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, mine hand, O house of Israel. And what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to, pu to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And, if, and at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. We'll read through verse 10. If I do evil in my sight... If it do evil in my sight, that it may obey, or that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Let me say this before we mention anything about the lessons. I have a good comment here about <clears throat> God repenting. Elsewhere it says He's repented. But repentance on your level and my level means that something's not been done right. And I'm admitting it, and I'm the fault at fault here, and I'm changing. I've changed my will. That's not how it's applied to God. God does not change. Now, if we love Him and from the heart obey Him and serve Him, that draws one response from God who does not change. If we rebel against him, disobey him, and live in sin, that draws another response. Now, since God's not a man that he functions in time and space as we do, then you have it written, though, to people who are here, us, and we do change. We can know the truth, love it, and obey it, or we can know the truth and reject it, or we can remain ignorant of it. We change. So the repentance idea here is not fully repentance like a man. Simply saying, if you love the Lord and keep His commandments, He's going to bless you. If you don't, He's going to punish you. But to try to express that from a being that does not change to us who are changing all the time, it takes limited language set and accommodating us in the way we come to understand things. I thought this would be a good time to make a little bit of a comment about repentance when it comes to the Bible saying God repented there's a great lesson in this more than one lesson in the passage a first lesson is that God has a plan for every life maybe we think of God's plan more from the standpoint of the plan of salvation and everybody must believe it and we obey the same thing having believed the same thing but do you ever think about you personally that God has a plan for you? We sometimes, I don't think, think about that nearly enough. Paul was separated, he said, from his mother's womb to be what he was. What, what is that telling us? Is that God in his providence in view of the fact that he knows all that is the object of knowledge, he's omniscient. 
knew the caliber person Paul would be. Didn't go against Paul's will, his free will. You'll remember too that he said concerning Pharaoh of old that I've raised him up. Well, God again knowing all that's knowable, he's omniscient, being all powerful and ever present. Then he can know the end from the beginning and all minute things in between and all about it. And he's in control. That doesn't mean he's going to force you against your will to go to heaven. You don't want to go to heaven, you don't have to. If you want to go to heaven, you can. Of course, all of it's on his terms. The point I would make here is that God has a plan. He had a plan not only for the children of Israel, but many individuals among the children of Israel. Now, we are spiritual Israel. Does he have a plan for each one of his children? Now, you think of human parents who really love their children and want to rear them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and prepare them to be able to have a wholesome, good life on earth as much as one can. They like to have some kind of plan. Doesn't always guarantee the kid's going to do a certain thing. That's not the point. How can you rear children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and all that that implies and not have some sort of plan about them? Raise up a child. Bring up a child the way he should go when he's old and not depart from it. That's talking about parents having the wisdom uh, to see which direction children go. It's not necessarily talking about being saved from sin. It's talking about you've got two or three kids they don't all, all of them aren't going to be concert pianists. One might be. One might be really leaning toward music. Another might lean toward carpentry. And thus the parents develop them accordingly. There has to be some sort of planning going on among parents that are doing all things decently in order. You know, that applies to a family as well as it does to the church and everything else that pertains to God. So we might do ourselves a question to say, I wonder what God has planned for me. Well, then how am I going to find out? Well, I do the best I can to know the truth, to live it and to preach it and to practice it every way I can, and the doors will open. It may be that there's a time in your life that will be later in life when all that you did in life brought you to that point to where there's where you're most helpful. You don't ever know about such things as that. But you know this much. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So there's a divine pattern not only for the spirit spiritual body of Christ the church but for each one of us and I'm not speaking about some sort of predestined and foreordained Calvinistic heresy I'm talking about simply that God operates decently in order and he certainly has things in mind for his own children members of the church God intends that we conform to his will and in doing that, then we become vessels that he desires. Now, the point here is God's the potter. And he forms our character. And he shapes thereby our destiny. How so? Because we as clay, we can be formed. Well, how's that? Receive with meekness, the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. Meekness means you're commandable. You will do what he says when you know what it is he wants you to do. And thus, it is said of Abraham, I know Abraham, but I will command him, his children, and so on and so forth. God knows whether we have a disposition of heart that says, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth command and I will obey. Yeah, but what is he going to tell you to do? Well, whatever it is, it won't be for my hurt. 
It'll be for my good. It'll be character forming, literally. We use that sometimes sort of chuckling, but that's true. It'll be character forming. What do you think we're doing as we label to bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ? As we set our affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Well, we're forming characters. Like whose character? God. Our whole time on this earth, among those who are wanting to go to heaven, is showing God that we don't like it here. We want to live where we can be in perfect peace and flawlessness with God. And we're therefore going to fight the things here on this earth that handicaps us from knowing His will and doing what He said and facing life in the light of the truth. Can you think of the perfect example? Of course, it's Jesus. Jesus is the perfect example of compliance with God's will. You remember, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest I am a king. Now listen. To this end was I born, and to this end am I come into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice, John 18, 37. That's why the, the Christian, even in becoming a Christian, must love the truth. It's the only thing we've got that will set us free from sin. And sin is the only thing that separates us from God. In John 18, 37, in this account, Christ is making it clear. There was that which only I could do, and I came to do it, and it was the Father's will. Truly, it benefits all men, but it's what I had to do, and I did it. I'm where I am today, he's basically saying to Pilate, because it involves my doing what's necessary to save man from his sins. And what's so interesting about it, he could have said, and that covers you too, Pilate. A second lesson, and I think a much needed warning, is that a life may be marred in the making. Well, I think immediately we think of things. How many people have made poor choices, bad choices, wrong choices, and they were marred, some of them, in repentance upon recognition of the bad choices, having learned the truth, people can change. They can turn around and augment some of the things and put it back in order. There are some things when you make a bad choice, it's so marred you can't put it back in order. When they let Paul, Saul of Tarsus, hold the clothes of those that stoned Stephen, no way in the world, all the repentance possible on the part of Saul, could he bring Stephen back? I've often wondered as he thought about Stephen's death and his part as an unbeliever in it and all the others he persecuted because they were faithful servants of Christ. If he was thinking about as he fought the fight of faith and underwent persecution himself as a faithful child of God and apostle of Christ, if he was thinking about, well, I can go someday to where they are, and they'll know that the very thing that I opposed them over and persecuted them on, I became a part of it. That's a wonderful thing. But there's some things in life when you've marred it, it's done. That doesn't mean you can't repent of it, obey the truth and be saved, but it means it's altered your life. And it's there with you as long as you're on this earth. We might say, well, you know, you cut your foot off. That foot's cut off. Now, I don't care how good an artificial one they put on it, how well you get around on it. Your natural foot's gone and always will be. A second lesson and a much needed warning, I think uh, that comes out clearly in, in this second lesson. 
that it should be pointed out that even though our lives are to be subject to God, of course, if they're not, we, we must account for this. Yet it's true there's a difference between a lump of clay and a human life. A lump of clay is helpless in the hands of the potter. It doesn't have willpower. It has no power of choice. It does not have the wherewithal to make a decision. So we have to realize that when we take what's said here by Jeremiah, even as it was applied to the people of his day, and we apply it to our day, we must know that we have a will and we can choose. I've had people all my life, and for a while I didn't know enough to answer it right. People say, how many responses have you had recently? Well, it dawned on me Anybody that listened to my preaching made a response. Today, at the end of this preaching, you will make some sort of response. You either listened, understood it, and it benefited you, or you listened, you didn't like it, and you rejected it, or you didn't listen. <laughs> but that's the response. Usually what we mean is how many people heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel or repented of their sins, but that's not the only responses there are out there. We have a will, and we can choose. In 1 Kings 18, 21, and Elijah came unto all the people, and look how up to date this is, and said, how long... Will you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. Now listen and see if this is not up to date. And the people answered not a word. They didn't want to commit one way or the other. 1 Kings 18, 21. Now he come down as we're familiar with this one. Maybe more than that one in Joshua 24, 15. He says to the people long years before 1 Kings 18, 21 time period. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods and the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But it's for me and my house we will serve the Lord. That's a good affirmation. Just to say when you rise up in the morning, I'm going to serve the Lord faithfully all day long. If I do that, if I meet whatever comes my way today with a thus saith the Lord in my mind, in my actions, my words, I'm ready for whatever may come. Tomorrow, if tomorrow comes, and if tomorrow doesn't come, you're ready for eternity. We can resist the potter. It's done all the time. We can defeat God's purpose in our lives because remember, He's long suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We have the power to spoil His design, His pattern, and His purpose for us. When we transgress God's law, it's nobody's fault but our own. When we rebel against Him to do things our ways, then that's something we did. No use passing the buck or attempting to. It won't work anyway. But what is God seeking to do? He's seeking to make us great. He's seeking to make us useful. He's seeking to make us beautiful and to make us fit to dwell in His presence at the end of time and material things when we've been resurrected in the likes of the Lord. Paul said this to Timothy, Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some unto honor and some unto dishonor. 
The notice I talks about the importance of our reg regulating ourselves according to the truth of God. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified meat, which means suitable for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. But the submit must be there. The desire to know and to obey, 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21. Of course, the ultimate pattern is Jesus Christ. For herein too were you called, Peter wrote, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. 1 Peter 2, 21, 22. Going back to the letter to the, book, to the Romans, Romans 8, verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he also foreordained to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, Romans 8, 29. That's what I said a moment ago, when we as members of the church are faithful, we're simply spending our lives showing God we want to go to heaven. Colossians 3.10, And have put on the new man, that is being renewed unto knowledge after the image of him that created him. God desires to make every person like Christ. A vessel that's beautiful, and a vessel that is useful to him. When I think about that, it, it always crosses my mind. What does God have in store for glorified humanity in heaven? Doesn't that just sort of go over your mind? What is there about making us as he makes us through the gospel system and our willingness to comply with it that will set us ready to do what he has for us to do when we can walk in his very presence? What is it? It must be some tremendously, tremendously great thing. There are no superlatives to describe it. And he's in the process right now as we love him and obey him according to his son's gospel of making us over in the likeness of Christ. It's amazing. A third and I think a very important lesson is this, not that the others aren't important, it is possible, and I've already touched on it in repentance, it is possible for a marred life to be made over again. You've heard me say this from time to time, and I'm sure you've thought it in your own mind concerning yourself. We're in the land of beginning again. We all stumble, and some falls we take are much harder than other falls. But we can, through the gospel and our love of it and obedience to it, rise up and start over again. How grateful we should be to God for his long suffering. Because he wants everybody to be saved. Second Peter 3, 9, as we quoted earlier. And he said the same thing to the young preacher Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, when he said, Who would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? Notice the connection being saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. Nobody's going to be saved apart from the proper knowledge of the truth. It's the truth that makes us free. So he doesn't cast us off. He doesn't cast us out simply because we stumble and bumble around because we're in the grace of God and we're in the land of growing and developing. The faithful child of God is going to stumble. If you think you're going to reach a stage in service to God on this earth where you don't make mistakes, you're going to be in miserable shape altogether. But God in his infinite wisdom through the gospel system has preserved us, has allowed us to be in a state of favor in his sight, allows us to be able to grow and to develop. I think of Peter most often, and he boasted so much that he would stay with him and wouldn't leave him and all of this at the time of our Lord's betrayal. 
And yet he denied him three times. The Lord looked at him that last time. And I wouldn't want to see the Lord, but I wonder how often he's looked at all of us that way sometimes. And, and Peter went out and wept bitterly. Well, sometimes it takes that to get us back where we pray we want to be. You remember that, folks, when you're praying. Help me to be this, help me to be that. Well, sometimes it takes a, something that will make you from the heart weep bitterly in order to get you where you belong. God's always desirous and willing to give us second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth opportunity. But you will see it in the faithful child of God. When he makes a mistake or she makes a mistake, they don't just sit down and quit. They back off and hit it again. You see that in every other part of life. Anybody that's successful. Now, the raw material is what we are. And he will make us over with our cooperation into the likeness of Christ. You know, Israel, like a... The pot that was created was often marred in his hand. But notice, he continued to work with them. He implored her to repent, and he was ready to offer forgiveness. Listen how it reads. Wash ye, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing... and obedient then there's the whiteness and the cleansing of the purity if you be willing and obedient to them it was, you'll eat the fat of the land the good of the land but if you refuse and rebel you shall be devoured with the sword for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it Isaiah 1 16 through 20 that's what's happening right now it's just on having to do with spiritual Israel Giving us time to change. What is our conclusion? Well, has our lives been marred by sin? Well, there's people that say, well, I know they have been. But that's not the real question. Are you willing to do what God said you need to do to change those things? To be made over? To be what God wants you to be. Hebrews 8.12 is a good place to stop. For I will be merciful to their iniquities. And their sins I will remember no more. So as long as time goes on, whatever there is in your life that is amiss, you can change it. Sometimes it's going to be like Saul of Tarsus just repent of those things. He can't go back and actually change. But there are other things when you repent, you turn from a certain practice or whatever, you can turn over, as we say, a new leaf and start down the track that the Bible sets you on. But remember this one thing. We are being made in the likeness of Christ. As long as we're humble, and obedient to his will. We can't see it maybe from day to day. It may be like buying clothes for children that are growing. You don't see them growing, but when you, when you see what they wore last year and now what they've got to have this year, you realize a lot of growth is taking place. And that's the way it'll be with us spiritually. And our knowledge of the Bible, our practice of it, our being steadfast in things. So we ask ourselves what kind of pot am I? What kind of clay vessel am I? 
Well, we do differ from an actual clay vessel. We have an eternal Father who's our potter, but we must be yielding to be made after His will. If you need to obey the gospel this afternoon, it's the time to do it. That's the beginning place to be made anew, to be created anew, to be a new creature in Christ. As a child of God, any particular sin or sins, then if these words will motivate you to repent of them, whatever they are, private or public, confess them and pray God for forgiveness, then that's what, it, what we want it to be, what we intended it to be. So as I said earlier in the sermon, Every one of you responded to the sermon. Everyone here. And God knows the response. If you're subject to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.